and I'm going to talk about game and simulation development with Qt. And uh, I'd first like to mention that I'm not a Qt contributor or anything, I'm only a user. And so these are only my uh, experiences working with Qt and uh, they may or may, may not apply to, to the stuff you are doing. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little about simulation programming because that's what I do and the difference to, to normal game programming. Then I'm going to uh, focus on some topics in uh, Qt Core uh, and mention some of the Qt widgets that are appliable uh, to uh, game programming. I'm going to talk about Qt Quick, which is the uh, 2D scene graph that is in newer versions of uh, Qt. And yeah, I'm going to skip through some other game related features of Qt that may be useful. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm from Bremen, Germany. Uh, as I just mentioned, I'm a simulation developer, and my uh, interests are, of course, Qt, then, then Linux uh, game development, uh, Open Scene Graph, and uh, yeah, different game engines. And I uh, studied at the Bauhaus University Weimar, where I worked with uh, virtual reality setups and uh, multi user collaboration, where people uh, share virtual spaces. Uh, after university I did some game development and now I'm working at Rheinmetall AG in Bremen in the simulation department where I uh, <coughs> work on simulators and uh, visualization tools of various kind. And uh, with simulations I, I mean uh, this kind of simulation. Okay. Oh, it's a little dark, right? This, um, uh, this is a ship security simulator over there where people run around a, a ship and uh, put out fires and communicate and stuff. And uh, this, this is a ship simulator, different one. And uh, so it's about simulating vehicles or persons running around. Uh, and it's mainly training exercises uh, for uh, uh, preparing for real life situations. And uh, these simulations have to be realistic, at least on the level that is being simulated. So uh, it can be quite, it, it can be good to have an immersive graphics. And uh, simulations. Uh, have a lot of data. You have terrain data if you want to simulate real terrain. Uh, you have building blueprints where people run around. You have artificial intelligence data and of course uh, physics data for, for engine simulation or yeah, whatever you want to simulate. right? Um, and uh, the diff one of the differences to game development is that it's uh, less iterative. iterative. And um, in games, you can do it over and over until it starts to come, become fun. That's not the focus of simulations. You know from the start what you want to simulate and what to achieve. And um, you also have uh, dedicated hardware. You don't have to optimize for 10-year-old laptops. You can just say, we are buying machines for $5,000 $5, a piece, and if it runs on them, it's okay. And um, some of these uh, simulations run for a very long time, maybe a decade or two. So at the end they look really, really old, but as long as the simulation goal is achieved, that's okay. Um, so when I'm building simulation tools, I want to have handle a lot of different data formats. You have XML or uh, raster formats for sim uh, satellite imagery or yeah, a thousand other parts. Uh, so it's good to, to have tools to, to read in these data. Um, yeah, if you build a tool, you want to have some stuff that is uh, supported for a long time. So if you have really small open source projects where the developer may lose interest in a few weeks, then you don't really want to use that. Um, in my opinion, it's a good uh, thing to have cross-platform software, just that you can move it from Linux, Linux to Windows or back, because uh, some of the systems that you're integrating with may be on, on various platforms. Um, also, the other parts of the simulation, you're, not you're never running alone there. You always have a lot of machines, and you have to integrate with changing parts over the time. Uh, even the, the whole render engine may change, because, uh, yeah, Old 3D graphics doesn't look very good, so from, from time to time you may want to change that part. So it's a good thing to have that modularized so you can exchange it. Okay, now why would I use Qt? Of course, uh, Qt has a very good uh, user interface uh, parts. I mean, that's the main part that you, uh, Qt does. Qt or Qt, I think it's both, both okay. Um, uh, Qt is also written and usable in C++. 
which is a good thing if you are integrating with other middleware from game uh, uh, game game engines or something. So you could want to integrate a uh, um, artificial intelligence or uh, physics engine, then it's a good thing if your own stuff is in Qt, so you uh, in, in C++, so you uh, don't have any problems there. Then um, Qt uh, has a stable API and ABI, so if you are programming for Qt uh, version 5.0, you can be sure that it runs with 5.1000 or whatever. It doesn't change, it, it only changes, um, they only add parts. Um, yeah, uh, Qt has a, a type system for dynamic type handling and uh, it has uh, introspection support. So that's uh, one thing that's always missing when you are doing C++ game development. I think these are the parts that uh, every game engine or game system needs. So it's good if you can reuse that and it's very yeah, nicely done. Um, yeah, Qt of course has support for XML, JSON, uh, SVG graphics, database binding, networking, multi-threading, and... Uh, Sorry, what is the difference between the type system of Qt authors and the basic C++ type system? I, I will show that in a minute, just for a second. Um, yeah, and, and you can also use uh, JavaScript uh, or other scripting languages that are bound to, to Qt. And, uh, there you can also use the, the introspection system just to have uh, script access. Now I have to start reading here, my screen is too small. Um, yeah, and of course it's cross-platform, it like, runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, uh, Android, iOS now. Uh, although I don't think uh, there are any of the new consoles supported, but maybe that will change now that they are more uh, 386 based. Um, yeah, and Qt also has a, a 2D scene graph that I will show. So if you are doing 2D games, that may be something interesting in and of itself. Okay, now the type system. Um, here, up there, you have a custom class, my class. It's empty because that's not interesting here. And uh, in the header, you have to call this Qdeclare meta type. And uh, this adds the class to the Qt uh, type system. And uh, you can use this to, to uh, fetch a type ID for the my class with a templated method, QMetaType ID, and you can use that ID to fetch the class name during runtime, which is of course a problem in, in uh, C++ if you don't add it on. And um, also you can uh, use it to uh, create objects of that class during runtime. So um, you can just create objects from a class if you know its name or its type ID. So it's, that's good if you want to do a, um, a factory class or something and uh, create objects from, from a file or something. Is yeah. that okay. Uh, uh, will it uh, stay the same as the ID? If if no, I, I think it's just counting up. So that's if you want to, so you should... Yeah, you should maybe use the class name or maybe there's some other method. If you, do, if you use the base uh, uh, types like float or something, that won't change. It's just your, your custom classes. I, 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 maybe there's some way to make it static. I don't know. Uh, I didn't didn't look it up. Now um, the whole uh, user interface parts that you see in Qt, like the checkboxes or text boxes or whatever, they are all uh, derived from the class Q object. And if you want to do a Q object yourself, you have to simply derive from class Q object and um, then uh, call the macro uh, Q Sorry. underscore object. Um, <laughs> now, uh, if you want to use uh, programming Qt, you always have to run a preprocessor for your code. That's something many people don't like, but um, I think it only adds a little complexity to your build step. Um, and this preprocessor called Mock, M-O-C, um, adds... Is there a close sign there? Sorry. Uh, I thought so. Now, um, Oh man. Uh, okay, so this Q object macro declares it as a Q object and uh, mock automatically adds some, some stuff to uh, the class to, to make it uh, more dynamic. For example, you can use the Q property macro to add uh, properties. I think I'll use the mouse, right? Yes, the mouse. So um, this property is called velocity and it's type of, of type Q vector 2D. 
and uh, these are the getters and setters that are used by Qt if you access this property. So you can read and write this property. You can also declare them as uh, read-only and there are some other flags I don't remember. And um, now if during runtime you, you analyze a Q object instance and you can see it has these uh, properties and you can set them during runtime or from a configuration file or whatever. Um, now down here is uh, another nice thing, Q invocable. Um, this adds uh, the, the speed method to, to the runtime uh, system. Now if you uh, pass a moving, or uh, yeah, this is called moving, a moving object to JavaScript, then you can call this uh, speed method from JavaScript. And uh, this is a very simple way to, to add uh, script bindings to objects. And this all works by magic from the compiler. Um, Okay, another thing, I won't go into this very deep, it's a signal slot connections. It's basically like an observer uh, pattern. Uh, uh, each Q object can have a number of signals and uh, a number of slots, and you can com co uh, connect signals to slots. And slots are just uh, basically object methods. Now, if uh, object 1 emits signal 1, then all connected slots are called. The slot 1 method is called. And uh, these signal slots connections can also have uh, a number of parameters. So maybe uh, object one has a, a, a signal um, value changed with an int parameter. Then all connected uh, uh, methods with an int parameter are called, and that uh, parameter is uh, passed to that. And um, the nice thing about this, uh, that is that it works across uh, threads. Uh, this is possible because in Qt, uh, uh, Qt expects to have a, a Q thread, which is a custom thread object, and each Q thread has its own uh, event loop. Now, if you have two ob uh, Q objects, they can live in different threads, and uh, if a signal slot connection exists, then uh, this is basically copied across uh, threads, and, and in the new next event iteration, uh, the slots are called. So this is a very simple way of doing complex uh, cross-thread uh, cross communication. Uh, in C++11, you can even connect uh, lambdas to signals. So you can just say, if signal object 1 emits this signal, then do this, int x, int x plus 1 or something. OK, uh, the Q-thread uh, object I just mentioned, yeah, it, it, it holds an event loop, and uh, each Q-object is uh, assigned to one uh, Q-thread. Now, if you start without uh, creating Q-threads, then you have one main uh, user interface thread where the objects live. Um, Q also has some other uh, high-level thread support. You have a Q-thread pool class, which um, can be used to, to assign tasks to a uh, a uh, specific number of threads. Maybe you want to convert 1,000 images, then you create four worker threads for each CPU core or something, and you uh, you just post these 1,000 uh, conversion tasks to the thread pool, and uh, it will feed it to the different threads. There's also support for futures and continuations, which you can use to do asynchronous programming. Just to mention that, I won't go into that. Um, now, one basic Qt uh, object is the Q variant which is the same, I think, as in, in boost variant. And uh, this is uh, a class where you can put values of different types. types. For example, float or uh, string. You can also put in pointers and even uh, uh, the, the objects directly, uh, which only works if you register when them with the Q-meta type system I just mentioned. And um, you can later uh, identify which uh, type of value is in the variant and convert them back. And uh, this is very useful if you do uh, script communication, uh, yeah, if you're working with scripts or passing that to files or stuff. And one nice thing of the Q variant uh, object is you also have a Q variant map, which is just a map from, from string uh, to, to Q variant. And Q variant map itself is a Q variant, which means you can uh, nest these, and you can very easily build, uh, yeah, trees of data that you can pass during runtime and uh, can do pretty complex stuff with that. 
uh, yeah, it's good for language binding, as I just mentioned. Uh, you can also serialize Qvariant to files. Uh, if you, you can build up a very complex data structure and just write it to a disk and later convert it back. Uh, you can also stream it across a network. Uh, so it's not very performant, of course. Um, every time you put something into a Q variant that is bigger than a, a I don't know, float or something, then uh, that object is created on the heap or in the free space. And uh, so you may fragment your memory and it's not very cache friendly and everything, but if you want to build some stuff quickly, then I think it's a nice thing to have. Um, if you have custom types, you can also register uh, conversion functions. If you have a class my class, then you maybe want to add a to string method to the variant so that it can be converted to a string. You can do that now in Qt 5.2 with the register converter function. So this is improving. Okay. Mm. Now you want to integrate Qt with your game. And uh, first thing you have to do, you have to create an object of class Q application or Q, uh, Q GUI application, I think, if you want to do uh, user interfaces. And um, you have to run the Qt loop. Uh, the simplest way to do that is to ha just give uh, Qt the control. Just uh, run the Q application as a method run, I think, and that starts uh, the loop and uh, then you can register a slot to, um, that is called by Qt for each game tick. You can just set a timer, 60 times a second, I want to call my update and render functions or whatever. Um, that's the easy way, but of course, uh, if you have an existing game, you maybe don't want to give Qt a uh, Qt add-on control of your game, so instead you can uh, instanti instantiate the uh, Qt application object and then call Qt call application process events uh, which does all the signal slot stuff and timer and whatever Qt does. And uh, so you can run that in the background. It's, it's a little little more complicated, of course, like it always is, but uh, this should work most times. Mm. Now you would probably want to run your game and uh, user interface if you want to do one in separate threads, because uh, if you're... Uh, Qt app, uh, user interface is blocked somehow, then you don't want your, your game to uh, stop and the other way around. So you, you run those in two separate threads. And uh, I would suggest uh, having all communication with uh, signal slots so that no, no blocking and no, no deadlocks or whatever can happen. Can you merge Qt with Merge? You mean use together? I'm pretty sure that you can. I mean, it's both C++. So I don't know about the main loop issues there. So, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's possible, yeah. So you, you, maybe you can pick the, the important parts of SDL, uh, maybe whatever you do, and, and leave... Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you, if if you only want to use the Q variant stuff from from Qt, then you don't have to start any event loops or something, right? So you can pick the parts that you need, and then you have to look at how you are integrating the two. So, of, of course, it's some work, but I think that it's it's possible with that to integrate it with about everything. Yeah. And our argument against already existing libraries. Was always yes. They don't look as nice as a uh, home drone. <laughs> okay, if you are a really good programmer, <laughs> sure. But I think uh, Qt is very, very, um, yeah, uh, very nicely constructed, yes. and it's very it's hard nice to. Game outside, hmm. Do you have an example game? Uh, yeah, I'll mention that at the end, right? <laughs> okay. No. Uh, oh, did I skip something? No. Okay, so one, one useful thing to have in a game if you are developing is to have a list of all your game objects. Now, um, um, you can use the Qt table widget from, from Qt, which is just yeah, a list of stuff. And uh, now uh, you can do that by um, 
you can communicate with signal slots. Maybe every time an object is created, emit entity created with the name of the uh, object. And every time it is removed, uh, emit an entity removed. Then add that to that list. And uh, I think that's al already a very useful thing to have just to, to yeah, for, for analyzing and debugging. And um, another nice part of Qt, which is actually not part of the Qt main distribution, is uh, Qt Property Browser. If you ever used the uh, Qt Designer, User Interface Designer, then you already know that. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a property browser. You have all these named properties here, and uh, they have uh, different kinds of editors. And um, you can uh, s simply feed that with uh, Q variants. So if you want to, to make a, your object visible in the Q property browser, you simply send a Q variant map with all the properties of the object uh, through the threads to, to the Q property browser and uh, feed that with the various properties. And uh, if you have a float value, it will display a, a spin box. And if you have a color value, you get a nice color picker. You can even do, uh, I think there's a font picker here somewhere here, right? Yeah. And, um, you can also do custom editors for your own classes if you add them. For example, there's no uh, 3D vector in Qt, uh, at least not a 3D double vector that I needed, and uh, so I had to, to build my own editor for that. And uh, that's a little bit of work, but it's possible. And um, you can also uh, add configuration to the various uh, editors. If you have a float value, you can add a max value, a min value, a stepping range, and stuff like that. And, um, was yeah. this built into QT, or was this an example? Uh, uh, yeah, this, uh, this is part of the QT solutions archive, which you can look up in the internet. And uh, it is actually not distributed with the QT API. It's a, diff it's a separate project. Um, I also have a question. Uh, this means that I can define an uh, object using the whole QT or TPI system, and just say display that object and it will use the RTTI version. Yeah, that's the next that slide. Device. Now, um, you can, um, if you have a game object, then you have to convert that to a Q-variant map. So you have to know about your object and uh, pick out your properties somehow, named properties and their values. And um, yeah, if you have that as a Q-variant map, you can send that across uh, your signal slot connection to the Q-property browser. There's some code around it, of course, so it doesn't really accept Qvariant maps, but it's very easy to do. And then, uh, yeah, it displays all your values. Um, if it, if those are Q objects, it doesn't, doesn't work automatically? I think it does, yeah. Uh, I think there's an example distributed with that, yeah. So you can just make all your game objects Q objects and then... Yeah, but you, uh, you shouldn't uh, pass Q objects across threads. So if, you are, if your Q object is living in the game thread, and you want to show that in the user, user interface thread, then you should have to copy it anyway. So I guess this is a, yeah, it's an easier way, I think. Uh, and now if, you are, if the user changes something in the Qt property browser, you can uh, connect to that signal and uh, pass the changed values back to your game and uh, apply them somehow to your game. Okay, so as I just mentioned, Qvariant does uh, heap allocations. So um, if you are doing an editor or something, that's probably okay. If you are doing a game with uh, 60 hertz and uh, you're allocating stuff on the heap all the time and deleting it again, then that could cause performance trouble. So that's probably not a good idea. Um, also, if you have a lot of game objects, then probably you don't want to use uh, the Qobject class because it's quite heavyweight. Each Q object uh, instantiation uh, creates a private uh, implementation object on the heap. Also, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going in the background, so it's probably not a good idea. If you have 10,000 objects or something, then you shouldn't use Q object for your game object. Okay, now time to pimp my project. Um, this, this is the stuff I, uh, I, I just talked about, and I have it as an open source library. Uh, so here's the game object list, here are the properties with nice color pickers. And this is actually a, an example that I, uh, a working application that I programmed for an in-house customer where uh, he wanted to place uh, sensors on a car, which is very abstract here, it's just a cube, and he wanted to see where the sensors overlap. So um, I actually um, 
added another uh, functionality to the QObject browser to have uh, lists of stuff. So um, if uh, here this, this sensor placer object has a list of um, uh, sensor uh, objects, and uh, you can add and remove from that list, and it just edits its uh, QVariant map and sends it back to the game. So if you are removing a sensor here, uh, the whole list is passed again, and, and all the unused uh, sensors are removed. What's happening now? And um, QT entity is a um, component entity system, which some of you may have heard of. It's just um, each game object is composed of a loose uh, collection of components with no central intelligence. And um, here, I, I did, the components are not Q objects. They are because I wanted to have them in consecutive memory space, which is not just possible with heap allocated objects. So uh, I did my custom class. And for each component, I have a conversion function from and to QVariant map. This is another example, a little more gamey. Uh, you can here, here you can, can have an, um, an enum editor. What's happening with the projector? And um, here are these emitters. Uh, there are particle system emitters where you can add emitters uh, as many as you want. And um, the graphics part here is uh, done in Qt Quick which is a lot nicer looking if it's not so dark. And um, these are SVG graphics, vector graphics directly passed from Qt and uh, displayed in a, a 2D scene graph. And okay, now next part, uh, Qt Quick. Um, so Qt Quick is, is quite new, I think. It started in Qt, I don't know, 4.7 or something, and, or 4.8. And it's a hardware accelerated uh, 2D scene graph. And it's supposed to have become really fast now in Qt uh, 5.2. And uh, they do a lot of op optimizing for render, bunching, and whatever. And um, Qt Quick is uh, declarative, uh, it uses a declarative syntax, declarative? I don't know, uh, called QML, uh, which we just talked about in the previous talk. And um, I think I have some examples here. No. Okay, and. Um, and here you see the, the Qt Creator editor, so you have a visual editor for stuff like that. I, di I think it doesn't work with every uh, functionality yet, but I think it's coming to, towards Flash territory somehow with uh, all the editing methodology. And uh, this is a syntax example. Uh, it's, I think it looks a little like, like JSON notation. And you have uh, yeah, nested, nested objects and um, properties and values. And these actually use the QObject property system that I just talked about. So you can pass in uh, QObjects here and uh, set their properties with the syntax, uh, with the QML syntax. And Qt Quick uses the syntax to do yeah, uh, 2D graphics. And uh, you can also embed JavaScript here. Um, and you can also uh, somehow connect values that you, if, if one property value is changed, then all the dependent values are updated. And uh, the nice thing about this for Qt Quick, you could only need a text editor. You don't have to recompile for the different platforms. And uh, I think it's great if you want to do uh, mobile phone games and stuff like that. But uh, oh yeah, and also um, th uh, this is a new thing: Qt Quick components. So all the um, Qt uh, widgets are now, p or some of them, I don't know, are ported to Qt Quick. So these are really hardware accelerated and uh, scriptable and skinnable and everything. And you can do yeah, very complex user interfaces with that. And um, I didn't really do any work on this, but of course that's my, my next goal to have uh, cute quick overlays. So you have a 3D game and you have a cute uh, interface for that. If you're having com uh, complex um, user interfaces for your game with lots of heads-up displays and stuff, then you could use uh, Qt for that. And um, Qt Quick renders to OpenGL, I think OpenGL ES2 or something, and you can combine that. Here on the uh, bottom right corner, this is Open Scene Graph. Someone uh, did that. And uh, this is a custom uh, OpenGL from, from a Qt example. Uh, I think this is not even QML, uh, Qt Quick, I think that's normal Qt. Um, 
So I think that that would be a nice thing if you're having a complex user interface that you can use all this signal slot goodness and uh, compose that in an editor. Uh, what's the time? Yeah? Yeah, I think so. I think you can change it. I don't know. Uh, OpenGL. It's, both. it's uh, OpenGL uh, 2 on desktop, or uh -huh. 2 and higher, and uh, ES2 or embedded. Uh, oh, all right. And I think uh, on, on Windows, there's even an abstraction uh, layer so that it renders to DirectX to get a little more performance. Angle. Yeah. Uh, or we have the option to use Angle on Windows. I, I just talked about that. What's the reason? Is that for performance reason or compatibility? It's uh, Thank you, Nestica. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, if you want to distribute a game, then you want to keep it slim, especially if it's over the network. Uh, so this is something I don't really care about because I'm doing simulations. But I guess if you want to ship your game, then uh, Qt I think has 40 megabytes uh, now because there's a 20 megabyte DLL just for for translation stuff. So you can uh, get that a little a lot slimmer if you do static compilation. Although uh, maybe if someone is interested then in that, you should contact Qt because there are licensing issues. Uh, Qt is licensed under uh, uh, GP, uh, LGPL, which allows linking, but I don't know if you are allowed to do static stuff. I think the opinions differ. And, um, but I, I just tried it out. Uh, I got it around to around 7 megabyte, uh, the Qt part, which includes the, the user interface stuff. Um, uh, th that was the sensor application I just showed you with the car and the sensors, and um, so that took about nine and a half megabytes and all. So if you are doing a professional game, then then maybe you should think about that. Um, okay, what else is in Qt? Just to to mention those Qt multimedia, uh, which can you can use to to play video and audio stuff, and uh, you have Q Q camera to access the webcam on. Um, Mobile phones, you, you can access the sensors, I think, and the um, GPS stuff. Then, um, yeah, Qt has some OpenGL stuff, which is pretty, uh, yeah, some, some low-level support, I think. It's, it's not really a lot of high-level stuff. It's just to, to ex access the extensions and, and uh, bind, uh, abstract away some stuff. Um, <coughs> then there's the Qt Quick 3D project, which is, uh, does some declarative uh, 3D programming. I don't know about the, the current status of that. I think it's asleep at, as of now. Uh, then, of course, Qt has support for internationalization, which is great if you want to ship your game to a large audience. And uh, I don't think there is any game controller access, which I don't think is so great. So maybe uh, for that you want to fall back to SDL or something, or cre create a, uh, use another library. So because it's all C++, it's not that big of an issue. Okay, uh, there's even a commercial game engine, uh, vPlay it's called, which is, I think, uh, targeted towards mobile phones. Here you see a, a Box 2D physics uh, demo. Um, okay, uh, that's the stuff I know about uh, game programming and Qt. Um, to conclude, I think it's great if you are doing tools and editors and stuff where you don't really have to look towards uh, accessing the last 10% of, of uh, performance for everything. Um, the introspection is very helpful if you are doing dynamic and data-driven stuff. Um, it's good if you want to do complex user interfaces, of course, and it's just a big load of stuff that you can use for your game, and you don't have to, to grab it from everywhere you can. You, you just have one central pot of stuff where you can, can get your game functionality. Yes, thank you very much. And there are questions, please. Uh, I, I, I guess I, I, don't, I don't need it. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I have a question ha um, about perception handling. Does Q3 actually do anything uh, related to that? Uh, no, I think you can comp compile it without. And 
I think they try to, to not use exceptions, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you, you can live it out. Yeah. Actually, I have a second question about yeah. the whole uh, hardware accelerate, accelerated uh, quick queue. Uh, um, how abstracted is the rendering part? I mean, if I wanted to have it rendered not to OpenGL but some other uh, uh, API, how big of an effort would that be to port it? <laughs> no idea, sorry. It, it would be I, quite an effort. It, 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 the implementation details of the QQuick2 same graph are very OpenGL specific right now. It's not impossible, but okay. much harder than that. Yeah, maybe you could do that at the angle part, right? You can do angle to another system or something? I don't know. <laughs> Mentioning the, the merging of the main loop and the GUI loop, but with, uh, uh, if you're using OpenGL or hardware accelerate the GUI, how would you keep it thread safe? Well, because OpenGL is not thread safe. Yeah, um, um, you, you should keep them separate, you shouldn't mer merge them. And uh, if you have sig only signal slot communication, then that's all asynchronous message passing, so you don't have shared data. and. Uh, so there, there shouldn't be that much of an issue. But then you're saying your game loop is not drawing anything? Or no, the, the, the game loop is drawing to the OpenGL window or something, and the user interface is drawing to the user interface. So you have to do that in, uh, on the, the window manager layer, I think. I, I don't know. So, yeah. You can't use the user interface. Oh, oh if, you are, and if you are using Qt Quick or something to draw over your 3D scene, then you can't separate the two, I, I think. So then, then you have to merge. But if you have separate windows for your property editor or something, then you can keep them separate. Yeah. 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 Um, the demo I just showed is, is exactly that. Uh, the, with the spaceships. Um, Oh, come on. Here. Um, oh, the user interface stuff is just using uh, C++, and uh, the game is using QML, and uh, I, th I think I, I just use it for rendering. I have a method to uh, create shape with a texture area and uh, draw that to the stuff, and then uh, all the rest is done in C++. So uh, I, I had tried, uh, I tried to, to somehow read the, the QML properties and use that to directly display them in the property window, but I didn't get that to work yet. But maybe that would be uh, also be very useful. Then you can declare your properties in QML and have them in the, the interface. But yeah, I, I don't know if that will work. Yeah, it's it's declarative, uh, decl yeah, declaration of, of user interface stuff. Oh, it's text right. file. Okay. Yeah, and you can. Uh, I think there are some tools. If you want to do a mobile game, then you can just use the Qt mobile application for displaying QML and uh, feed it, uh, feed the, your QML to that uh, application thing. Yeah, so that's a very easy way to do cross-platform stuff without uh, doing any compiling or anything. Okay, no more questions, then yeah, thank you very much.